Friend, I am so glad you are catching this podcast today because Lisa is here and she is amazing. In fact, I don't want to waste any more time. I want to jump right in. Lisa, welcome to the podcast today. Thank you so much, Melissa. I'm thrilled to be with you. Well, I am really thrilled. I've really been looking forward to this conversation together. Lisa, you are the CEO and co-founder of MinerGuard. And that's an artificial intelligence software company. Artificial intelligence is coming at us in all directions, and it's exciting and terrifying and all of that at the same time. What particular nuance of artificial intelligence do you champion and do you hope to bring about to the mess? Yeah, so I think, you know, when I think of artificial intelligence, to me, uh, you know, having an engineering background, it's really just a tool. It's not a solution. So I think that there's a lot of use cases people have seen in science fiction movies, for example, or in news clippings about it being misapplied and causing harm. And that's definitely possible. But I am really focused on what can be done to solve big, hairy problems at scale that just we haven't been able to touch before. And the area that I'm particularly passionate about is improving outcomes for marginalized women and children globally. And that's where having a tool like AI that can look at data in huge amounts and make better predictions of how do we solve some of the challenges of things like human trafficking, child sexual abuse material, uh, live stream terror events, or even you know getting diagnostics in healthcare for chronic conditions can really be uplifted by applying this new capability to a space where maybe science hasn't spent enough time doing the research because the data can tell us what is and isn't working for people at a more personalized level, and we can adjust our course of action from there. This is fascinating. I mean, when we talk about changing the world, you are talking about huge changes to huge problems in the world, being able to do that with humongous data sets, if I'm hearing you correctly. But interestingly, you also said to make it more personal. And that just seems like two opposite things to me. Go big or go home. Well, that's the promise of digital transformation. And we've seen it a lot already in our daily lives in recommendation engines for marketing or for product selection. Uh, the advertising industry has really taken advantage of this. They can collect enough information to understand what people like us are interested in and make more probable recommendations for things that might benefit our lives and create a more frictionless customer experience. And the beauty of that is it's all happening kind of quietly under the scenes. Um, and so it's not something we have to learn a lot to be able to take advantage of. And what I'm really excited about going into 2023 is that that kind of technology is starting to proliferate into additional industries that tend to be a little bit slower in adoption. Things like healthcare, things like public safety, things like, uh, you know, government, um, places where they move a little bit slower because the risks of problems are higher. But once they can integrate this capability, I really have a lot of hope for seeing improvement in the moments that matter around climate change, around uh, civil rights, around um, equity and dignity in our world. We're going to have a lot more wisdom gleaned out of the oceans of information that are created every day. It, it's been estimated that 90% of the, the data on the internet today has been created in the last two years. And 80% of that data is unstructured data that needs some kind of interpretation. As a result of that, humans can't possibly ingest all of that to make better decisions as the subject matter experts. And so as we can start to look at some robotic process automation and looking at optical character recognition, some of those capabilities that are open source tools in artificial intelligence today, nobody has to create them from scratch. They already exist. You can apply them. We can start to really get much more personalized treatments for healthcare, 
uh, that will work better for you based on your genome, based on your environment, based on people that live like you do versus just a one size fits all solution. Uh, same thing with things like crimes, money laundering, human trafficking, things like that. Follow the money has always been the wisdom. And when you have all of this information being generated and we can start to actually glean the right insights out of it, I'm really excited about the ability to make sure that people that are manipulating the systems to victimize people, they're leaving a trail. We just can't find it yet. And I think that's where AI is going to be really promising. The image or analogy that came to my mind when you're describing this is when I start a really good novel, a novel with some substance and complexity, because at first it jumps around to different, completely unrelated people, context, situations, and it takes about 100 pages to get a sense that, okay, these are going to intertwine, these are going to be related, and all of these diverse factors are going to come together and produce an action, a context, some kind of situation, a coming together. That's what it sounds like the potential will be with AI, that I picture a bunch of detectives in a squad room with a bunch of coffee and they're stressed out trying to find which data is relevant and which isn't and what to follow and what to ignore. Is this what we are getting to that we can st streamline and prioritize the information? Yeah, let me give you an example. I think there's a lot of fear that AI is going to replace everyone's jobs and we're all going to be unemployed. And I'm not as concerned about that future as maybe some others, because what I think it is going to require some upskilling. But in the example of that detective, this is based on some real work we've done with nonprofits, the tech industry and law enforcement around recovering known child victims of sex trafficking. So the challenge that was brought to us back in 2017 was that facial recognition technology had mostly been trained on adult white male faces because that's the labeled data that's publicly available. Obviously, we protect children's data for a reason. Um, but that did not generalize very well when they tried to apply those models to the problem of identifying known missing children. The missing children posters that the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children produce tend to have grainy, low-quality images of the children, whereas the escort ads online tend to be well-lit with a lot of makeup and a lot of, you know, done upness to them uh, because they're advertising. And so we weren't getting a result that was a close enough match recommendation based on the existing models to make it usable or actionable. Uh, but when we looked at it, what we decided was we never intended to take the human out of the, lo the loop in the process. The detective will always be there. So how can we make the detective's job easier? And the way that we were able to look at accomplishing that was by organizing the photos in the order of which one was most likely the same person. So it might not get the first photo right. But almost every time of the top line of photos of the first five, it was in there somewhere. So envision a day that you go from scanning tens of thousands of ads looking for a specific person to a day when they're organized right next to each other in a tool, and you just have to go, yep, number three, that's the person. And they can set up the meet, they can recover the child, and they can work on reintegration into our society for that victim versus doom scrolling, just hoping to stumble upon where this child is. And an example of that, the first month that went into production, they recovered 130 children. Wow. Whatever it takes to keep children safe. I mean, I say that with a grain of salt, but seriously, whatever reasonably or even somewhat unreasonable tactics to keep our children safe, let's do it. And also, these crimes tend to affect disproportionately people that are minorities. How can we leverage that to make that loophole disappear or to close? Well, extending that, that use case, we know that trafficking vi victims tend to be diverse teenage girls, which shouldn't perform well on those models. That facial recognition had 70% accuracy. It just had so many mistakes, it's, it wasn't useful. 
when we were able to shift to that more modern approach with uh, nearest neighbor searches, we were able to get it to 99% accuracy. And that's how you give detective good enough tools to go and recover those children. And so I think it's a matter of recognizing that every model is going to have to be specified for a business case, whether that be a law enforcement use case, whether that be a banking use case, whether that be a healthcare use case. And once you know what you're solving for, you can optimize a solution to work well for certain demographics based on the data that you feed into it. And so that's why I'm really, really passionate about encouraging more women to go into data careers and become data literate, uh, because this is where the emerging skill sets are going to be in the, the workforce for things like product development and a lot of the tools that we interact with every day as consumers. And I want to see a lot more women in the boardrooms helping make the decisions when they're being made so that they serve a broader population of people than just the typical demographic of tech workers in Silicon Valley. Amen to that. Amen to that. Now, we've talked about um, how it can help solve that particular horrific crime. Can it also help keep children safe when they're online? That's what we set out to do with our minor guard solution was to identify that a device was being used by a child or registered to a child, uh, that an image that was being taken on it was explicit in nature and thus a felony to create and block that image from ever being saved on the device. Uh, today, that technology can be applied by using a family iOS account on an iPhone 12 or later. Um, you can set that up in parental controls. It used to take 130 choices to block your child from doing something like that. In settings today, it's a single one. So if you go to my website at lisathee.com slash TED Talk, we show you how to set up that capability in there and also more about our journey in terms of developing that technology to disrupt human trafficking. And that link will be in the show notes. Friends, pause the podcast, go to the show notes, click on that link and enact these settings so that we can keep our kids safe online. The best thing we can do as a parent is help police not create this content in the first place. Yeah. And not just do the setting and be done, but keep monitoring what our kids are doing and keep asking them questions and making sure that they're doing what they say they're they're doing and what they're supposed to be doing. Absolutely. On my page at the bottom, there's a couple products out there that parents can use to help in that AI monitoring. They're the things that I subscribe to, being an insider and, and knowing what works and what doesn't work. Um, and I just decided to put my name on that and my code on that to give you a discount because I want to see more parents engaged. You really are the the gatekeepers for the digital lives of your children. And I wanted to make it as easy as possible to find something that works. So um, I'm a big fan of Gab phones for first phones. That's what my elementary school age children use because it doesn't have the overhead of the internet on them and social media when they age up and I have to unlock the world of the Instas and the TikToks and all of that. Um, I, pl uh, I plan to use Bark Technologies, which is where I partnered uh, once I, I exited from MinorGuard on the Android side of the market. Um, there are many solutions out there that work. Uh, those are the two that I choose to partner with because I think the technology is best and the user experience is best. But my encouragement to you is do something instead of nothing. Whatever you do is going to be beneficial. And usually when people are grooming children for bad choices, um, it's not one moment that matters. It's staying engaged that matters. Parents are really the safe harbor for their children when somebody violates their boundaries online. And it's really important to be an ally to them when that happens and not freak out and take their phones away because then they'll be secretive. Mm. That's a tough, tough situation. And thank you for those uh, 
those tools that we can use. And again, all of those links will be in the show notes. Make sure you click on those links and enact these safety measures. So can we jump over to healthcare briefly? You've mentioned that these large data sets can help us on an individual level in healthcare. How does that all come together for us? Sure. Yeah, the the earliest experimentations that I saw in that uh, were during my days as an AI solution owner at Intel Corporation. Uh, there was some really interesting work happening in uh, 2015-16 around a collaborative cancer cloud where research institutions were sharing data in a federated way to be able to train better predictive models for care. And what that allowed them to do was to ask questions of the information without seeing personally identifiable information. So let me give you an example because I think it makes it a little easier to, to grok. Uh, so an example of that would be, I'm a woman of a certain age with this type of ge genome and this particular cancer diagnosis. And I want to know whether to take drug A or drug B to have better outcomes for getting my cancer to remission. Well, in order for recommendation engines to be approved by the FDA, they have to have a certain amount of data diversity to guarantee that they will perform as well on somebody that's middle-aged versus young, uh, different ethnic groups, different gender groups. And so it's really, really hard within a HIPAA-controlled environment like that U.S. healthcare system to have access to enough information to prove that you've done your research and it will work better uh, based on somebody's genome. So it was a collaboration that happened between the technology companies and some of the major cancer institutions like uh, MIT, Harvard, um, Oregon State University. And it allowed them to ask a question of the data without having to see my name, my patient medical record number, all of those things. It can say, how many women have you seen that are within this age range that have this type of genome and have this diagnosis that have benefited from this treatment. And it can return, it can query all those places without commingling all the information and come back with an answer. It could say seven. But if it only went to one research hospital, maybe it could only get two. You can't get, you can't move forward in medical research that way. So I'm really excited about federated learning and the use of confidential computing to accelerate a lot of rare diseases that maybe don't have enough information at one hospital to be solved. And so we partnered with a, a really promising startup called Beekeeper AI that has a solution offering in Microsoft Azure to help accelerate FDA model approval for people that are developing healthcare technology to, to help in this space. And so I encourage anybody who is doing startups or in pharmaceuticals or in medical equipment to explore their capabilities. Uh, that's Beekeeper AI. Um, and you can check out their offering in the Microsoft Azure store. We helped build that solution for them. And we'll have a link for that as well for people to check out. Is there this, is this technology present also in the diagnostic side of healthcare or mainly in the treatment side? More early days right now, what the technology does is it really acts as more of an escrow account for data. So it's helping people to find the right data to train their models so that they can cut down the amount of cost and the amount of time needed to get FDA approval for the models. We estimate it, it takes about a 50% reduction. What those models are focused on doing has a wide range of applications. Great. So you are an ethicist in the artificial intelligence world. What are a couple of the big questions that you grapple with? What is an acceptable cost of doing business? Nothing is risk-free. How do we balance the risk between privacy and safety? How do we define privacy? Is privacy really, in the example of the crimes that I focus on, what's more important, the privacy of the criminal who doesn't want people knowing what they're doing? or the privacy of the child who's having the worst day of their life watched by other adults for entertainment thousands of times a day. I think we have some really big challenges in terms of bringing more experts into the technology space 
and not making engineers the ethicists um, to help us navigate these waters. And I think we need to bring a lot more technologists into government to be helping to set more appropriate regulation. Um, we didn't have car seats in cars for quite a long time uh, because we didn't believe that we there was a big enough risk that required them. But eventually the data showed that there were more accidents happening and seat, seat belts mattered. So we all have to wear them today, even if we are good drivers, right? <laughs> I look forward to the day that the internet has some guardrails for us all. And yet, I, when you say it, it sounds such an obvious answer of, obviously I wanna protect the kids, but also in my day-to-day -day life, I don't want to give out my genome for anyone to use because, yes, the AI models can use them to track criminals, but also criminals can use that or other people can use that that don't have ethics departments. So it's not always so cut and dry of the privacy issues and the safety issues. There's such a, a murkiness in there. It's always going to be two sides of the same coin and no trade-off doesn't have an impact on the other. And so that's why I think it's going to be really important that we we get more technologists in the regulation space and more regulation people in the technology space to come up with the right balances because that threat landscape will evolve over time and uh, we need to evolve along with it. And life is a continuing exercise in asking the big questions and sitting with the difficult questions. And we make real progress when we do that, when we don't shy away from it, when we do sit with what's uncomfortable and bisect it and look at it from all angles. I've been doing that for quite a few years now. It, it never gets easier, but it gets more tenable. And if we want to have better outcomes for everyone and democratize dignity, we're going to have to sit down and, and face some of the hard questions. Lisa, I have a hundred questions going through my mind that I would love to ask you every single one of them. Maybe I'll have you back again someday and ask you a few of those, but I do know that you are working on a cause that is very close to your heart right now related to keeping children safe and in an environment where they know they are valued. Can you tell us a little bit about your project and how we can help? Sure. Well, first, I'd actually like to answer your first question. Um, if you're interested in more, learning more about my work and how you can apply mission to your work, obviously, Melissa, as a pastor, you have that intrinsically, but maybe some of your listeners are looking to inf infuse more mission into their work lives. Uh, I'm releasing a book in 2023 called Let's Go. A Women's Guide from Burnout to More Sustainable Life, where I share a lot more about how I redefine my career to focus on the moments that matter and how I've been able to adjust over time with the challenges that we face with this pandemic to maintain impact while I have developed some permanent disabilities. Uh, and I want to give a guide for other people that are maybe looking towards the future and wanting something a little bit different than what they've had historically. So if you go to um, lisafee.com slash go, you can get a free preview of the first two chapters of that book. And it answers a lot more of your questions, Melissa, about some of the work that, we're, that I mentioned today in a lot more detail, as well as guides on how to define what your, your life's work can be that will give you mission. Uh, secondarily, uh, the organization that I wanted to mention today is one I've been a board member of for about six years, and it's called Three Strands Global Foundation. And it is an organization that's focused on prevention and reintegration services for victims of human trafficking. And I'm really passionate about their mission because uh, they are training children about healthy boundaries in school programs in eight states now, and we're continuing to expand. Uh, we just developed programs in Canada and even into Africa. 
We also have reintegration services for victims of human trafficking that are looking to be part of our society, but have probably missed some school, have probably had some PTSD, have some special needs. And so we provide services to get them gainful employment in our local communities. Uh, in my local community in Sacramento alone, we place about 200 people a year. And I'm really proud of the generational opportunities that that can provide for not only the victims of trafficking, but their children and breaking cycles. And so if you're interested in supporting that organization, um, I think the holidays are a really nice time to think about where you can give back to your communities. And I know that Three Strands Global Foundation will make good use of every dollar that's donated because I see the, I see the balance sheets. And I have a lot of confidence knowing that um, teaching teachers about what to look for in classrooms, connecting communities with resources, and being on the front lines to help make sure kids get the help that they need when somebody is trying to take advantage of them is the way that we're going to end this terrible crime. Friends, human sex trafficking seems like a huge issue that we are powerless to do anything about from our place in this world, but this is an action you can take that will make a real difference in this effort. So make sure you click on those links, get informed, and make a donation. Be an active participant in healing and preventing these horrific situations. Lisa, I want to thank you for sharing all of this today on the podcast. Thank you so much, Melissa. It's been a wonderful opportunity.